Hi, I'm Tommy Ivo, and I'm all decked out in my Grand Marshal shirt here. I was just the Grand Marshal up at the Hot Rod reunion here a couple of months back, and that's so much fun to go up there you wouldn't believe it, because all my friends are scattered all over the country. And how do you go back to Boston to have lunch with someone? So we all get together up there and lie to each other and just have a wonderful time. Because every time you tell a story, it gets better and better, you know. It's kind of like this one right over here. If you want to follow me over here, this right here is the most exciting thing that ever happened to me in my life. It was my e-ticket ride. It was a brand new race car that had four runs on it. We'd taken it out here to the Winter Nationals. And there was a chance we weren't gonna qualify for the race because we had trouble with the Magneto. So the last run, it was a do or die run. And boy, was it ever. The engine, you can see the fire coming back off of it here. It exploded so severely that it zeroed out the downforce of the wing with all that heat around it. And when I came off the throttle at the finish line, the thing rolled over and ran 240 miles an hour upside down and backwards. Ye gosh, you can see why I think that's the right of my life. But you know, it was a brand new race car and when it exploded, it killed everything inside the motor, of course. And then when it rolled over, it ate everything off the outside. So a brand new car went down the drain. And I'm telling you, it was worth the price of admission. Wow, was that a ride. The only thing that made me mad was it scared me so bad, I closed my eyes and missed the whole show. Well, listen, why don't you follow me over here? This is something that I'm really proud of. Right up there, they took up half of the Hall of Champions at the NHRA Museum. And we had my twin motor car that I'd borrowed from Garlitz's Museum. My four-engine car is over in the corner. That's after it had the body put on it. And this little Model T Roadster right up here is the first car I ever built. I built it to go to Bob's on Friday night. I had nothing to do with racing, you know. But you had to have your Roadster if you lived in Southern California. We went out to the desert here in Palmdale and found the car laying out there. It had a yucca tree growing up the middle of it. But I went out there with a, with a truck and a saw and cut the tree down and took it home. And we took the little top, which was a standard size top, and I said, let's not put the window in it until we decide what we're gonna do. Because they had round windows and oval windows and three squares and everything. And when we walked back into the place, I looked at it and it looked like an outhouse to me <laughs> with that big top on it. So we put a half moon in the back of it, <laughs> just like they have on outhouse doors. But we had more fun with that car. And then I took it to the drag races and I won a trophy, I won two trophies, one for class and one for uh, for winning the, for setting a track record actually is what it was. And I was hooked. The hook was set. I made about a hundred movies and a couple of hundred television shows over a 19 year period. And I built the cars just for something to do. In fact, my old shop is right here where this trophy room is. I made a series called Margie. I played Haywood Botts in it. I was always a 
tin-thumbed, bumbling boyfriend, and he just thinks, I guess I look like one or something. What can I tell you? But I went out to the drag races, and I was 115 pounds. And I got in those cars, and strapping them on was like putting on a RoboCop outfit. And it was like a duck taking the water. It was great, you know. Actually, I got my four-motor car running. In fact, there's a picture of it right up here on the wall. We took it down to the set to take pictures of it, and they said, uh, well, you know, that's not a good idea for you to be driving that. So they grounded me. No more drag racing. So when the series was over, everybody was walking around with doggy eyes, you know, oh, we lost the show, we lost the show. And then they heard this commotion over in the, in the dressing room and someone's doing handstands over there. It was me. Oh boy, I get to go drag racing now. And I thought, you know, drag racing likes good weather, movies like good weather. You had to pick one or the other. The movies I'd done for so many years, and although it was really great, it wasn't new, the cars were new and exciting, that was it. I stopped the movie career and went racing, had another 20 year career on top of that, and I just had a pretty lucky life. Okay, let me show you this right here. These are all the models they made of my car over the years. And that's my first world record holder. Let me take it right over here. We have a nice picture over here. This car right here was the first car to run in the eight second bracket. Ooh, that was in 1959. They're, they're running in the four second bracket now as far as elapsed time is concerned, which is just about two times as quick. But this was a little monster to drive. It had two Buick motors in the thing. And we took and run one engine backwards and one engine forward and then put it out the drive shaft to one differential on the rear end. It was 88 inches long. When this thing left the starting line, it would pull the wheels up like that and drive down the course like that. I'm telling you, I had more guts than Dick Tracy to drive these things. But here's a nice little picture of it right up here. Behind me is the exhibit sign and for the exhibit that they had at the NHRA Museum. It was up there for a couple of years. And the, the car in the center right next to me is the actual twin motor car. I borrowed that from Garland's. He had it in his museum down in Florida. And when I had it out here, it was pretty tattered looking. It had been around for a while. So I made it brand new. And Don comes in and looks at it and says, you touched up the colors on my Rembrandt. I'm telling you what an old crab that guy is. He wouldn't be happy with nothing. Of course, I guess it has nothing to do with our competitive nature that ran on so much over the years. I used to aggravate him on person, in per, on purpose because he was so excitable. But you know, there's nothing but good memories because we did this during the time of mom, apple pie, and the American flag. And you know, times just weren't better than that. You know, it was so simple in those days because I could build a car, drive the car, tune the car. I did all the bookings, everything from the CEO to being a street sweeper. So when you won, the ah factor is just that much better, you know. I realized that there's so many fans up there in the stands that like to watch the races, but they also like to be entertained. And so one time we were over in England racing and they had some little buses that they were running us around in. And they had big tall windows that went from about your elbow up to the roof. Now over here in the States they were still using those old Greyhound buses. Remember. I'm a little long in the tooth, so some of these memories go way, way back. But they had those little portholes, 
And I looked at those windows in the bus and I said, man, that's the ticket. Because we used to tow the trailers around with Tommy Ivo written on the side of it or Don Garlitz, whoever it happened to be. And we'd wear out the hinges, opening and closing the doors because everybody said, can I see the car? Can I see the car? And they'd squeeze in there and look at it. I said, I'm going to put glass windows on the side and they kind of looked at a little heart's content. Man, the other racers, they teased me to death on that. They said, when are you going to put the calliopes on those things? But you know, it's been over 30 years since I sat in a race car, and people still remember me, which just tickles me pink. So maybe I did make the right move somewhere along the line. We, we took a truck, and I put glass sides in it, put two dragsters side by side, put a Corvette up on top of the whole mess and use that for a town car. Did that draw some attention? I had lights, I had a generator in there and I'd turn it on when I was going down the Pennsylvania Turnpike and it would look like a jewel showcase, a little jewel showcase. And we had CB radios and I could hear all the truckers talking to each other and they'd say, did you see that Tommy Avo car going down mile marker, near mile marker 110 going south? And they couldn't believe their eyes. So we had more fun with all of that stuff. I had 36 different cars that I ran into 12 different classes. I started out with a stock car, then I went to my Roadster, then I went to the rear engine, or to pardon me, the front engine dragster. I get a little confused from time to time. The motor sat in front of you. I had eight of those in a series. Then we took and put the motor behind the driver, which the safety factor was so much better because when the engine blew up, the whole world would turn yellow in front of you. Then, of course, I went on to the funny cars and then took a jet engine out of a Banshee fighter plane and put it on wheels. So the funny cars, they took one of these big powerful engines and put it in a regular car and ran it down there. And it was really an odd looking thing because they took the rear wheels and moved them forward of where they were supposed to be so it would get more weight transferred to the back wheels onto them and get a better grab of the ground. And someone walked up and said, man, that's a really funny looking car. And it caught on. And that's what they've been called every time. Now, they were pretty funny. Boy, were they exciting to drive. In those days, we didn't have straps that would hold the supercharger on the top of the motor. And whenever the thing exploded, the first thing it would do is it'd fire all the fuel inside of the manifold, which would throw the blower off the thing. It'd throw it about 50 feet in the air. Now, if you had a rear motor car, the motor was behind you, a dragster, and it'd throw it up in the air, and by the time it came down, you were long gone. Who cares? But now with these funny cars, it was right in front of you. It was tucked back into the windshield a little bit, trying to get the motor back as far as we could. And when it launched, it tore the windshield out of it. And then, of course, you were almost always at speed at the finish line when you did it, and the 250 mile an hour wind would tear the roof off the thing. And the thing would go bang, and you'd go like that naturally. Someone would shoot a gun off in front of your face, and you'd be driving along in a coupe, and bang, you'd close your eyes and open them, and you were in a convertible. Man, I'm telling you, that was pretty exciting. You know, it was a giant research and development program because they'd have two motors, four motors. I did. I had one motor, two motors, four motors, sat in front of the motor, behind the motor, funny cars, jet cars. We took an engine out of a fancy fighter plane and put it on wheels. And you'd sit way out in the front of it and the air ducts were alongside of you. So it was like riding a Roman candle. 
And I would have a little trick where I took and I would let the motor idle and turn on the afterburner and strike the motor and it would put a ball of fire about that big around and about 20, 30 feet long out the back of the thing. And it was really funny at night because when I'd do it, I'd look up in the stands and it would be pitch black up there. And the second time I would do it, it would look like there were 5,000 Cheshire cats up there because everybody was smiling from the fire and I could see their teeth reflecting back at me. <laughs> that stuff was so much fun. All right, here we are, back at the models again. This one. This car made me famous. It, uh, it, well, of all my cars I had, I hated this one the worst. It was so heavy with four motors in it, it was like driving a 200 mile an hour Sherman tank. But you know, it ended up being my signature car because it was so strange. Like I say, we were trying everything in those days. And when my two motor car was the baddest bear in the woods, it was the fastest and quickest car in the world. I thought, man, if two work good, four is gonna be better. So we took two engines and we put them back to back and coupled them in between. Those two motors drove the rear wheels. Then we took these two motors on the other side over here, coupled them together and ran them to a front differential right there, which drove the front wheels. And the torque from these motors laid this way and the torque from that, those motor went that way. So when you were jumping off and off of the throttle when you were driving down the course, it wouldn't tend to see to drive the car around. And it worked. It worked, that was amazing. And look at this right over here behind me. How would you like to look down the front hood of your car and see something like that in front of you? The thing smoked all four wheels. It would cover the car with smoke. And the people looking from the side couldn't see what was exactly going on. We had a string of headers right here, right down the middle and it cleared the smoke off here so the driver sitting back here could see where he was going. From the side, it was all smoke. So people would say, wow, how do you see when you're driving down the course? And actually, you couldn't for about 20 feet. You'd point it and pull the trigger. But of course, as the story got better at first, I'd tell them, yeah, it was 200 feet before I could see. The story got so good, it was half track before I could see where I was going. And their eyes would get that big and say, man, has this guy got some guts. <laughs> you know, a good story always gets better every time you tell it. I like the front motor cars because when you sat on the starting line, you could see the mist coming out of the breathers and you just had this dragon sit in front of you. You put it behind the driver, that changed everything. But the thing is, it only ran about 10, 15 miles an hour faster, but sitting up in the front like this, the ground rush got so severe it felt like you picked up 100 miles an hour because there was the ground coming at you. Then we changed over, and the next thing we did was we got these funny cars. Now, each car had its own thing that I really liked about it. The funny cars, as you can see, the wheelbase got very short on them again. We'd take and lift the body up like that to climb into it and put it down and make the run. The short wheelbase, the thing would dart around. So with the motor in front of you, you had all the flames and the excitement. It was like driving a little dirt track car around. Then you had the rear motor car and it felt so fast, this thing wouldn't go straight. It was all over the course. That made it that much better. Then of course I changed to my jet engine car 
as I say, it was like riding a Roman candle. That thing impressed me, because these cars would go from zero to 100, just like that. Then they'd start pushing wind, running out of horsepower, and they'd slow down on the pole the further down you got. Whereas that jet car, it rolled out pretty good when you first fired the afterburner, but when it got to 200 miles an hour, it went to 300 like that. And that was really exciting. And it made a good 10,000 horsepower. See these goggles right here? I was telling you about the, the blower blowing the body off the car. We'd put the roof back on and they didn't get the fiberglass just right and it came loose on a run and the windshield blew in and smacked me in the face. Look at those goggles. Now it didn't hurt the glass, it was safety glass and stayed in one place, but the force of it hitting me in the face, I could feel those goggles on my face for almost a week after it happened. Here's the Ivo humor again. Down here, I have the push bar off of my first single engine car. But I had this little Buick motor, and it was like a sewing machine motor. All these other guys had blown Chryslers and blown Osmobiles, but I was shifting mine. And I would run like a scared jackrabbit for the first part of the track, and then they'd be trying to catch me at the other end. And it was so funny because I'd take this key and use it for a push car, and a push bar. <laughs> it was like I wound the engine up before <laughs> I got ready to run. And we had more fun with that. And then actually, at the time, this was me, Poison Ivo. They always came up with all kinds of names. Little man, instant Ivo, what have you. But this seemed kind of appropriate, and it was when I was driving that car. And then the movies came out, and I had a series going on television at the same time I was racing. And we all had Monica's, Don the Snake Perdone, Big Daddy Don Garlitz, Tom the Mongoose McEwen. So TV Tom, they hung on me, and it seemed to have stuck. Let me show you this. This is really something. <laughs> you know, when these guys quit driving, they always say that they burn their driving gloves. Well, TV Tom, Drag Racing's Master Showman, actually did that. Look at those little beauties right there. What I did was I made my last pass, came back to the starting line, and they have these little flamethrowers, small torches, that they burn little spots of oil off the track before someone runs. If someone drops a couple of uh, drops, I grabbed that, took these on a pair of tweezers, and burned them up on the starting line. Only me. <laughs> Okay, I think we're done with that room. This, of course, is in the, in the living room here, in the grand room, I guess I should say. This is my proud stuff right here. They made these two models, then they followed it up with this one here. That's my first fuel car that we took to England and everything. It was just great. And we have the Drag Race Hall of Fame, which I was in on the first calling on that. Oh, we have the first time they ever gave a Lifetime Achievement Award away from, uh, from uh, NHRA, of course, the Grand Marshal. And this is my most proud one from the Motorsports Hall of Fame because they only take one person in a year, so it's a very limited deal. And Mario Andretti, Dale Earnhardt, 
all the boys were in that, and I'm pretty proud of that. And here was another Lifetime Achievement Award that, ironically enough, Verdone started out as I was the driver, he was the crew guy, or tire wiper, as we <laughs> called him in those days. And we ended up with, he was the person of the year, and they gave me this Ollie, which was really a nice Lifetime Achievement Award. John Force Warren was there, just all the guys that are the guys. And I'm pretty proud of it that we put it all together. And this is the poster that they made up for that Motorsports Hall of Fame of America. As I say, there's all kinds of guys in there. And of course, we use the old fire burnout shot there again. They didn't want to use pictures of cars blowing up, but they said, in this case, that's, that explains Tommy Ivo, Drag Racing's Master Showman. Well, now here's something that's a little fun. We drug it out just to show you. I've got keys like when we were in England racing from the Berlin Hilton. I used to grab these keys to collect them from all over the world. And in the old days, these were before the cards, you know, and they had a little postage mark on them that said postage was prepaid so that if you walked off with the key, you could throw it in the mailbox. Well. My mother, I had twice this many in bags, and my mother decided she was going to save me from going to hell for stealing motel keys. So she took those two boat box, those two bags over to the mailbox and dumped them in. And when the postman opened that box and all them keys fell out from all over the world, it made the front page of the local paper. They never did know who did it, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay now, how do you like that little puppy behind me? That's pretty exciting, isn't it? You know, when I was in the movies, as I said, for a couple of decades, that kind of got instilled into me. So I always had a camera in my hand when we'd go places. Uh, my mother used to run around when a new movie came out and she'd get a whole bunch of 8 by 10s of all of the movies from National Screen that distributed them. And it got set into me in the DNA that I always had pictures. Boy, am I glad I did that. This thing right here, what we did with it, that's not really an explosion, not like that rollover shot that we talked about, but it, we took and put down five gallons of gasoline. It's what they call fire burnouts. We had some rosin and it had some flammable material in it. We'd pour it down on the ground in front of the tires, step on the gas, and it would smoke the tires and stick hot rubber to the ground, which was like hot glue. But the headers pointing up caught the flame of that flammable fluid in there and went poof. And we thought, wow, look at that. So we spiked it with a little gasoline and man, did that work. So we do that at the track and then we decided to take a picture for a handout. Took this thing here, dumped down five gallons of gasoline, and it singed everybody's eyebrows within 10 feet of what went on. I was wondering when they lit it why everybody's mouth went like that. I thought I'd better get out of here, there's something going on. And we used that picture for a very long time. In fact, we even used it for the cover of my book that you, you can get on Amazon right nowadays. It's uh, Tommy Ivo, Drag Racing's Master Showman.